Next one that I want to know it's late in the evening, and so I want to make this short and sweet so you can go enjoy the sunlight, maybe some wine, some food. Um, and so we're going to talk about the kind of the, the coalescence between exercise, keto, and fasting in the context of autophagy. Who here has heard about autophagy and or cares about autophagy? Pretty much every single person in the room. So one thing that I find interesting is how these trends kind of pick up, you know, on the internet, right? Like, you know, when keto started to get hot in 2015, I was like, okay, I want to interview people and learn more about that, really for selfish reasons, and then help other people along the way. And I've noticed this dramatic increase in the interest in enhancing, in enhancing autophagy. Thank you for letting me know. If I ever talk quiet again, just please point at me. Closer to your mouth. Like this. All <laughs> <laughs> this. Yeah. I'll just start making out this thing. And we can, everyone will be okay. All right. So these trends are really fascinating. So what I'd like to do is just understand the molecular mechanisms. And uh, autophagy is interesting because if, if I see the word autophagy, what do you think? What comes to mind? It starts with an cell. Fasting. But when you think of ways to enhance autophagy, you naturally think fasting, right? Yes or yes? Yes. Most of you do. But, but you'll be surprised if I told you that most of the data that we have in humans with regard to enhancing autophagy is via exercise. Who mm -hmm. here's heard that before? Not many people, but some of you. From you. Over at you. So I was really surprised. I was like, wow, why is, no one, why is everyone talking about fasting as a means to enhance autophagy, yet we have an ample amount of human clinical studies showing that exercise also enhances autophagy. So I thought that that was really cool. Admittedly, I'm very biased because I love exercise. Exercise changed my life when I was 14 years old. It's a big part of my life. And I like to eat, and fasting is great. I'm fasted right now, but I would rather exercise as opposed to fast all the time. So uh, that's where we're going. Uh, disclaimers, we're not gonna cure, prevent, or diagnose any diseases. We're talking about the science. I do have books and online programs and supplements, none of which I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, but if you want the slides, they're not available quite yet, but I'll put it up later tonight. Highintensityhealth.com forward slash autophagy. Very simple. All right, so I already kind of talked about this. Fasting is not, this is the take home message from this talk. Then you can go have wine, okay? Uh, fasting is not the only means to enhance autophagy. Exercise is arguably, if you want to look at the data and be evidence-based, there's a lot more data supporting the enhancement of autophagy through exercise. That doesn't mean you can't fast and do exercise. I think fasting and time-restricted feeding is something we all should be doing. There's so many benefits there. But I underscore the importance of this because I notice a trend in the keto community and the comments that I read, many of you thank you for them. I love in engaging with all of you on social media and so forth. But I've, I've seen a lot of a trend in the comments where people say, well, I've lost weight through keto and fasting. I didn't do any exercise, so therefore I don't need to do exercise. Has anyone heard, kind of heard this before? No. Yeah. I've heard that, and I, I, part of me wants to react and say, what are you talking about? But I just, I sit and think and listen, and I want to help you all understand, and help, hopefully you can share this with the people that you care about. Exercise is a part of humanity. We all need to be moving our skeletal muscle. And when we move our skeletal muscle, we enhance autophagy. That's what's really cool. So if we think about getting bigger muscles, getting stronger, losing body fat, all of all those mechanisms within the skeletal muscle are autophagy mediated. Check it out, right? So if you damage your muscles by going to the gym or doing 100 push-ups or sit-ups, that soreness that you feel, how do you think your muscles are recovering? It's through the process of autophagy. So literally, hypertrophy, strength increases, all that are through autophagy mediation, and I think that's really unique. Moreover, if we think about the tissue in the body that becomes dysfunctional with insulin resistant, resistance and, and, and we become glucose intolerance, what tissue type is that primarily? It's the skeletal muscle, particularly of the leg tissue. And this is, I'm going off script a little bit, but I'd love to reinforce this to a lot of you the more that you can activate your legs on a daily basis through walking, through squatting, through deadlifting, through resistance training, or sprints, or bike riding, anything to move your legs, the more insulin sensitive you will be. And so this is research stemming from Norway, Sweden, Finland, where they've done uh, basically infusions of glucose and insulin, and full uh, type two diabetics that require insulin, they have relatively insulin sensitive skeletal muscle in the upper body, but not in the legs. Okay. 
So think about that. If you, if you only do one thing, or only take away one thing from this talk, it's move your legs more often, walking, getting up. This is why standing desks are so popular. Who here has a standing desk? Awesome, me too, they're great. So that's where we're going. So autophagy was first described in the medical literature back in 1859. It's kind of like keto, right? Where keto was described first, I think, 1910, something along those lines. And so we're, we're getting this, you know, history repeats. Uh, okay, Banting, yes, okay. So all the, the, the point here, herein, is that, you know, we get these trends, right? They, they reemerge over time. And so autophagy has been known for quite some time. This individual studied sailors, where he observed that sailors they got lost at sea, they didn't die, they would just, you know, they would still live, and he proposed that they were catabolizing their, uh, their own tissues and so forth. And so we can do this through fasting, through exercise, and so forth. Uh, long story short, this is one of the only human clinical studies that has shown that fasting, looking at this marker, this is, we're gonna talk about the biochemistry very shortly, but this LC3B-2, this is like a, a transcription factor that is intimately involved in the metabolic adaptations that kickstart autophagy, you have to fast for 72 hours to increase this by 30%. Okay, who here loves fasting for 72 hours? Like, yes, I can't wait to fast for 72 hours. I mean, look, you feel great when you do it, but you're kind of like, oh man. Like I fast every quarter for three days, 72 hours, and it's like, Ooh, I think of all, every excuse that I can make to like get out of it, or maybe I should do this because I'm exercising or this. But the good news is we can all exercise to get the same benefit. Okay, so what does autophagy mean? It literally is translated into self-eating, self-digesting, okay? Uh, let's review some of the biochemistry. So a lot of you have heard about mTOR. Who here has heard about mTOR? Does anyone think mTOR is bad? So, some people some people do, but what, what we're talking about, we, Basically, we break down into kind of a du dualistic uh, sense. Autophagy is catabolic. You're breaking things down, okay? So in order to induce catabolism, you either need to be in a low-carb, high-fat state, you need to exercise, or you need to fast. Okay, so those are the kind of almost catabolic co uh, context, okay? If we think about anabolism, this is mediated through mTOR. mTOR is enhanced through exercise short-term, but it's also, in, in, we get more mTOR signaling after what? After we eat, okay? Question? Okay. So, uh, long story short, mTOR inhibits autophagy. That's what we need to understand about this. You don't need to be scared about mTOR. You don't need to be scared about protein. We need to understand everything in context. So in the post-meal window, friends, autophagy is not happening anyway. So you want mTOR to be stimulated. Question? How is it different from, I mean, remember it is insulin. How is it different from insulin? How is mTOR different from insulin? Just add that to your problem. Well, insulin growth activates up. mTOR. So basically mTOR is activated through growth factors, through insulin, through glucose. And there's a complex, actually, for those of you on Instagram, I shared a wonderful picture that eloquently illustrates exactly what you're referring to is the interconnection between insulin and mTOR. But the point that I want you to understand here is what we have is we have growth on one side and we have catabolism on the other side. So in order for you to enhance autophagy, you need to be in a so-called catabolic or facet state or do exercise. Because remember, exercise is what? It's, it's putting, you're, you're depleting your stored glucose and fat when you exercise. So it's catabolic in nature. I know you're building muscle in the post-workout window, but it's, it's catabolic. So does that balance kind of make sense? So we need to understand that we shouldn't be scared of mTOR, but it is an inhibitor of autophagy. And remember, mTOR is activated with protein, with insulin, with glucose. If you want to really stimulate mTOR all day long, you just eat every two to three hours. You have a protein shake, you have a steak, then you have another protein shake, and that will inhibit autophagy, okay? Here's the biochemistry of autophagy. You can take a screenshot of this or you can get the notes. Long story short, what we have is dysfunctional organelles and damaged proteins, mitochondria, and so forth that get, get uh, basically converted into this autophagophore that gets, um, either recycled or it gets dumped throughout the, throughout the cells. Uh, and so what, what we see is this is a great way to kind of take out the trash. And so the analogy that I make for people, imagine if you had a one bedroom small condo in Manhattan, okay? And you never took out the trash. You just would cook and put it on the floor. How long would you be able to live in that small one bedroom condo? Not very long. I mean, we compost in our kitchen. I mean, not in our kitchen, we store compost and put it in the back. And even after like two or three days, it really smells bad. You know, imagine if you never took out your compost in your kitchen or your garbage. 
Well, many of us, not in this room, not you all, but many people that are eating a standard American diet, snacking all the time, not exercising, their cells have compost that's stinking, okay? And what that manifests in later in life is dysfunction, insulin resistance, obesity, cognitive issues, uh, various proteins <coughs> accumulating within the brain, protein aggregation, right? So it's fair to say that many people in the industrial, in a Western world, have an autophagy deficiency of sorts, okay? And so hopefully after this talk, you'll learn different natural ways to, to uh, prevent that in yourself. So here's some more biochemistry. So we, we have basically that the big thing that you're gonna see in autophagy uh, insufficiency is aggregate proteins, okay, protein aggregations and dysfunctional organelles. All right. Here's a, a great paper for all of you that are nerdy and into science and mechanisms. Uh, David Sapatini published this great paper, but it, you know, the other thing I wanted to get into in not too much detail, but autophagy and mTOR are very tissue specific. So all of us probably have autophagy occurring in some tissue in our body right now. It's just a matter of proportions. If we were to all go run for 24 hours, we would probably have a lot more autophagy occurring in our muscle tissue and in our liver but, but it, uh, you know, all of this is going on at any given time, basal levels. We induce this through different mechanisms. But these are the specific tissue types that when there's not autophagy occurring, they become dysfunctional. So the pancreas, we know that that becomes you know, dysfunctional in uh, diabetes, the liver, skeletal muscle obesity, and the brain. All right. Now, what I think a, a big interest, why people are interested in autophagy has to do with stem cell activation. Okay, for the so-called cellular regeneration and anti-aging and longevity. And what we see is autophagy and autophagy-associated genes play a critical role in the activation of stem cells. Okay, so that's kind of the thing where if you're like, well, should I eat every two to three hours like this fitness professional says I should, or what about intermittent fasting or compressing your feeding window? You know, we, we do want some, we want these autophagy-associated genes to be upregulated during fasting and during exercise due to the fact that these stem cells and stem cell uh, synthesis and renewal is tightly integrated with the signaling of autophagy-related genes. All right, so you don't only, oh, there was supposed to be something that pops up there and that was exercise. Um, let's just quickly review some of the activators and the inhibitors. This is why I think it's great to work with healthcare practitioners that can see the whole picture, nutritionists, coaches that understand everything because you know, looking at all the different, uh, you know, thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is an activator of autophagy. And we all know how many, the, the prevalence of hypothyroidism, thyroid hormone dysfunction in our society is. So this is a systemic phenomenon and there's a lot of different natural ways uh, that we can enhance autophagy. And also I, I do want to throw this out there. Autophagy appears to be influenced by circadian rhythms. And the autophagy associated genes are most active first thing in the morning and while we're sleeping. And it kind of makes sense because that's the time of the day where we should be kind of deplete of nutrients, right? It's most, most catabolic. So this is why I think, you know, if you're really, there's mixed reviews, mixed data, is or not, when it comes to eating breakfast or not, because the circadian rhythm research is actually saying, well, if you eat earlier in the day, you might have more entrained circadian rhythms and there's various epidemiological studies that show that breakfast eaters generally weigh less than breakfast skippers, and it's really confusing if you're fasting. So long story short, if autophagy is a goal for you, and if you feel like you have a lifestyle-induced autophagy deficiency because for years, like me, I ate every two to three hours, had a protein shake and all this for a long time, um, for me, now I'm starting to you know go for longer periods of t time without food and skipping breakfast due to kind of maximize the circadian entrainment, and that knowing that the autophagy associated genes are most active first thing in the morning. All right. Um, now, if you want to inhibit autophagy, you can, <coughs> as we you know, kind of jokingly said, eat a protein shake every two to three hours, snack all the time, not go for long periods of time without food. That will inhibit autophagy, which you don't want to do. And I will say it's kind of interesting. Uh, autophagy is very nuanced. There's lipophagy, the breakdown of fat. There's nucleophagy, the breakdown of nuclear material. So this is really kind of, when you dive into the research, it's really nuanced and, and in my opinion, pretty fascinating and can get overwhelming because there's so much, um, so much data there. But let's get into the practical stuff here. I'm gonna skip over the, the, the estrogen part, uh, skip over the, the hormones, and just get into some of the exercise specific context so that um, everyone knows you know, what they can do. But even actually, this is interesting. So 
there is a highly statistically significant uh, correlation between individuals that have Crohn's disease and a mutation in autophagy-associated protein. I think it's ATG18. So these autophagy genes are related to ATG. So we're seeing more and more diseases. The kind of underlying pathophysiologic abnormality could be a deficiency of autophagy. So uh, more mTOR stuff, if you're interested. Uh, skip over this, skip over this. All right, let's talk about exercise. Really interesting stuff. So as I kind of alluded to when we were talking sort of off script, um, the adaptations that occur within the muscle tissue are autophagy mediated. So it's really neat. So if you go to the gym or you work out, you feel a burn in your muscle, or you feel sore the next day, there's a high likelihood that you stimulated autophagy and you kickstarted those genes. So I want all of you to start exercising more on a regular basis. Make this part of your lifestyle. A lot of people ask me, well, what's the best exercise? It's like saying, well, what's the best way to save for retirement? Is it bonds, stocks, is it real estate? Is it, you know, there's a lot of different ways to achieve the same goal. What I tell people when it comes to exercise is figure out what gets you into a flow state. If that's yoga, and, that, and that's something that you will do as part of your life, then do yoga. If it's Pilates, do Pilates. For me, it's resistance training. I just love you know, seeing my body get stronger and, and you know, the, you can see the progressions more linearly, I think, with resistance training compared to some other exercises. So, but the, the take home point here is all of us should be moving our muscles every single day. And for some of that, for some of us, it could be gardening or it could be walking, okay? Um, so as I've alluded to many times, uh, autophagy related signaling appears to be necessary for the normal adaptations of skeletal muscle. So when you get stronger, when you get faster, that's mediated through autophagy. Uh, let, let's, um, this is a really interesting study because this study was one where the average study participant was 69 years old, okay? So not necessarily young, and they did some very light resistance training with the course, I believe it was just eight weeks. So it was a very relatively short period of time and what they found was that there was a, a statistically significant increase in a, a variety of autophagy-associated genes in elderly subjects, okay? Now, remember, this is really important because many neurologic disorders, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, things like that are linked with protein aggregation within the brain and with other tissues, mitochondrial dysfunction. So you can prescribe, there was no dietary change, no fasting change, just exercise prescription in people that are 69 years old and there was a massive increase in autophagy-related genes and proteins. What exercise prescription? Yeah, so you could dive into the details of the study. This one, they did some resistant training. So it was just resistance. resistant training, yeah. So this was not aerobics. It was very basic too, and what they showed that um, these, these autophagy-related markers, and I'll, I'll dive into it, um, what they showed is that these, these autophagy-related markers increased not only just in skeletal muscle, but in the brain and in the white blood cells as well. So this is a systemic phenomenon. And I think that's what's really kind of the important thing. A lot of people think, well, if you exercise and you're moving your muscles and you enhance autophagy, is that just enhancing autophagy in your muscles? But it seems that once these genes are upregulated, there's a systemic effect. And so you're enhancing autophagy in other tissues as well, which I think is particularly exciting. So these are the markers. And if, I know a lot of you do research and you like to nerd out and stuff like that. If you want to verify what I'm saying and do additional research, the Becklin one is a marker that you want to type into PubMed and type search various things. You could do walking in Becklin one, you could search that term, and there's LC3B-2, uh, that's the other key marker. These are what kicks are the autophagy process within your body. All right, what else we got? Uh, so this study doesn't really apply to all of you unless you do endurance events, ultra marathoning and things like that, but there was a, a dramatic increase in various autophagy-related initiation factors in individuals that do a one-hour run six days a week. I know it's intimidating for a lot of people. I used to be a cyclist and I would train 20 hours a week, but I couldn't run for an hour straight if you paid me, so that's really intense. But uh, this goes to show that there, there is sort of like a dose-dependent phenomenon between duration of exercise and the enhancement of autophagy. So just keep that in mind. So long story short, to summarize your both resistance training and aerobics enhance autophagy dramatically, right? And again, the data that we have in humans when it comes to fasting is fasting, you have to fast for 72 hours if you want to be science-based. That improved autophagy by 30%.
And so again, we have th these data where people are exercising between three and six days a week and getting a massive increase in autophagy. Uh, this was another study where they just looked at, they had women <coughs> undergo a six month lifestyle intervention, no keto, no low carb, no fasting. Okay, so if you did all that, you might accelerate this. But what they showed in this particular study was just a little bit of weight loss uh, improved autophagy by 20% in various tissues throughout the body, okay? So diet plus exercise dramatically increased uh, autophagy genes, okay? So the question here, as you leave, what's standing between you and exercising and making exercise part of your life? I don't live with you. I don't, you know, I'm not in your home. What, what yeah, a lot of us kind of know, like, well, if I just did this, my business would grow. If I just did this, I could save more money. What could you do in your life right now so that exercise becomes a staple in your life? Think about that, that's your homework. And we'll, we have two more slides here, and then it's back to red wine. Uh, okay, so uh, calorie restriction is another way to enhance autophagy, but does anyone like counting calories in the room by chance? Nobody, okay, so you do, we have one person. Uh, yeah, so, so, what we see here is, th this was a group, I think this was at Harvard, and what they found is that they had individuals, this was a Western diet, so this was actually a human study, and they had individuals that had been part of these calorie res restricted groups. I didn't even know there was such a thing, but evidently in different cities, there's groups that people want to live for a very long time, and so they have these calorie restricted circles. They recruited people that had been intentionally restricting calories and documenting for over three years or more, they looked at different autophagy-related biomarkers and they found a, a dramatic difference. Remember, these are the two main autophagy initiators. So another way, if you don't like exercising, and you don't like fasting, you can count your calories and really restrict your calories and enhance autophagy. But no one, there's one person in this room, is willing to do that. So I don't recommend doing that. And uh, the, uh, this is gonna be very unpopular. And before, I'll just preface this. And say I'm not anti-protein at all. Um, looking forward to some grass-fed lamb for dinner tonight that's been in the slow cooker, but if you had a disease that was really characterized by a autophagy insufficiency, you might want to consider a low-protein diet. And so, again, I'm not advocating this, I'm just saying this maybe for clinical applications, you need to understand this. This is one of the only dietary therapies that I could find in PubMed where there was a correlation between changing in diet and an upregulation in autophagy in humans. And what they found is these individuals had a, a myopathy of sorts that was really incurable, they couldn't move, they had a lot of musculoskeletal issues that was mediated by an autophagy deficiency, okay? I don't know the disease uh, pathophysiology beyond that, but long story short, they recommended a very low protein diet. I believe this was like 30 grams of protein per day or less. And what they found is there was, a, a, over the course of a year, a dramatic increase in autophagy-related genes. Okay, so I just say this as a caution. I'm not trying to advocate low protein diets for any of you, but should you have someone that you know that has dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or some disease that is characterized by abnormal autophagy, you might want to consider potentially for a short period of time a low protein diet. What are you talking about? Low protein diet, what do you mean? Yeah, so this, this particular study looked at less than 30 grams per day. Of protein, and how much fat, and how much carb? I, I don't know every single so what are we doing macronutrient on that. It definitely was, a, was not a ketogenic <laughs> diet, but this was, a, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I could look at it and talk with you guys after on that. I, but again, I'm not advocating this, I'm just letting you know because there's a lot of people that really are excited about autophagy on the internet, that, that are what I've seen. And uh, so again, we have data on fasting, calorie restriction, low protein, and exercise. Those are the inter those are the, the buttons that we can dial and tweak. And it's up to you to figure out what's gonna fit your lifestyle and your health goals. Uh, yeah, and last thing, so again, we don't know the exact specifics on the macronutrients of this particular diet, but even though these individuals that had a myopathy, um, even though they were doing a low protein diet, they didn't lose as much muscle mass as would be expected. And so the thing that I want you to kind of understand is, and we talked about this earlier, is autophagy is linked with increased catabolism. And it could be that if you enhance autophagy, you might lose weight, you might lose a little bit of muscle, but there's this kind of uh, ability to get rid of say muscle that would, is not so healthy anyhow. And so these individuals didn't lose as much strength as you would have thought by the weight loss. So I want you to kind of keep that in mind because 
I do recommend fasted exercise. I think that if you exercise fasted, you could probably kickstart autophagy to a different extent. We know glycogen has some unique signaling properties and so forth. So uh, that's about it. Of course, this is a conversation for another time, but there's a lot of natural compounds and pharmaceutical compounds that can enhance autophagy. Rapamycin, does anyone take rapamycin or have heard about it? This is gonna, I think in the next few years, I think that a lot more people will be taking rapamycin, kind of microdosing several days a week, due to the fact that there is some pretty cool human data coming out when it comes to neurologic disorders, Alzheimer's, things along those lines. Spermidine is found in one of my favorite foods, mushrooms. It's more animal than plant, for those of you all that, that care, but mushrooms have a high level of this bioactive called spermidine that is, has been shown to kickstart autophagy in, in humans uh, and animals. And I think that's it. That is it. So friends, thank you so much for coming. Hope you enjoyed the Be here to hang out, answer questions if there is any. Oh, so does anyone want to use a mic to ask questions? A few of the people that I follow talk about using EKI as a um, way to test if autophagy is happening. Have you found that as a good way to test? Yes. Where was the question coming from? Oh my gosh, I was looking at I couldn't see it the microphone. Um, yeah, so the question was, how do you assess autophagy? This is a brilliant question, and I should have totally addressed this. And, and I'll just say, first of all, I, I should have said this too, I'm not an autophagy expert. I've just, for personal interest, have been diving into this, so this is actually a very brand new presentation for me. But how do you indirectly or directly assess autophagy? Well, the thing is, we don't, out, I think that's, uh, Gosh, what's the MD, the gal that's been promoting that as the measurement? Dr. Bond. Yes, yes, so she, she has her uh, GKI numbers and scales and things like that. I think looking at your glucose in the context of ketones is a great way to triangulate to see what's going on. Because, you know, you can be in ketosis but also have high glucose, right? And we know that to kickstart autophagy, we need low glucose and low insulin. So I think that is a, probably one of the best proxies that we do have. Um, the other proxy that I would say is, you know, if you're able to go without food for 16 to 18 hours without getting hangry, I think that's pretty good proxy that you're dipping into those fat stores. One scientific article that I didn't put up there, but I will mention right here, is there's a, a connection between autophagy signaling and ketogenesis or the synthesis of ketones. So if you can become okay in a fasted state and not get hangry and whatever, meaning you're, you're able to endure ketogenesis and, and stimulate ketones, I think that's a great indirect mechanism. So unfortunately, and I think this would be brilliant if anyone knows some investors to come up with an index to look at autophagy because that would be the next big thing because so many people, the, the interest in autophagy is crazy. It's like keto five years ago. Great question. Thank you. Hello, uh, Great talk, I love this by the way, because um, I'm a big fan of autophagy and exercise, so this is kind of up my alley. Um, so when a lot of people lift, they will take protein often before they exercise. Um, and you mentioned in your talk that amino acids downregulate autophagy while exercise upregulates autophagy. And so if someone is lifting while they're consuming protein or they're consuming a pre-workout shake before, are they not getting the benefits of autophagy even if they um, have better performance in the gym because they took a pre-workout? Oh man, this is such a great question. I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head is, when I go to the gym, I wanna have the best workout that I can get, right? So if that, that means having food beforehand, then I'm going to do that and often, so, that's where it becomes a little bit nuanced. Whereas if I'm gonna go for a hike with my family, I'm gonna go for a bike ride, like I'm not trying to crush it per se. So I'll do that fasting. And I know that, that I'm enhancing autophagy, dipping into those fat stores, depleting glycogen, all that good stuff. But I like people to go to the gym, get a good workout because the magic happens in the post-workout window from the signaling and from the breakdown. So that's where I think it's not you know, should you, there's not a one size fits all when it comes to training fasted or fed or having aminos and so forth. Um, you know, if you have a hard time building muscle or if you really get delayed onset muscle soreness in the post-workout window, 
amino acids can be great intra-workout and post-workout. There's really good data on that. Now you're like, well wait, but I want to enhance autophagy and build muscle, so then what do I do? And I think it just comes down to your personal preference. Is having five grams of BCA is going to totally suppress autophagy? Probably not. It's probably not that big of a deal, especially if you're already embarking on healthy lifestyle changes, your circadian rhythms are good, you're doing time-restricted feeding, things like that. So that's just my personal opinion, but I could be totally wrong on that. And, and I don't think anyone's really looked at that, but I've been diving into, for an upcoming book, uh, research on the hormonal responses to exercise in a fasted versus a fed state. There is definitely a difference in the post-workout window and intra-workout if you exercise in a fasted state. How long okay. has that work been done? Yeah, uh, most athletes, most of the studies, I should say, kind of have a standard fast for 12 hours before the exercise intervention. And some of the research that I've been looking at, they give these people a protein shake or an amino acid mix, and then they look at hormones, they look at genes and things in the post-exercise window. How long is that window? The post-exercise window? 24 hours. It can be 72 hours. hours. It, it depends on what you do. If you're walking your dog, it's probably an hour, but if you deadlift 400 pounds 50 times like Sean Baker did, it's probably several days, right? So it really depends on the intensity of the exercise. Great questions, though. Thank you. Anybody else? You can just I had a question also regarding somewhat the window, comparing the different methods. Like, how do we know how long we're seeing this upregulation? Is it just until you have insulin secretion again? Is it for that short time afterward? Is there some sort of autophagy sensitivity, right? Or autophagy resistance that we're seeing? So, kind of comparing the methods and you know the frequency of what you would need to do to engage in any of the methods to see some sort of increased sensitivity or increased uptake. Amazing question. Um, the answer is I don't know, but that's a really good question. I'm not really sure. You know, these studies don't look at that. Usually, these studies have one or two time points, right? You go in, they test your baseline, then after they do the intervention, they retest it. So, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's brilliant, and I think it's. But I will say that, and I should have said this: autophagy is not always good. So, if you look at in obesity, autophagy is upregulated within the adipocyte. You're like, wait, autophagy is good. Why is the adipocyte? So there is some tissue specificity here. If you look at metastatic breast cancer, depending upon if it's estrogen receptor positive or not, there's different autophagy being upregulated in some cancers and downregulated in others. So uh, that's the other thing that I want to emphasize is this science is so new. Everyone that's like, yes, I'm fasting for autophagy. I need autophagy upregulated all the time. You don't want autophagy upregulated all the time, right? You need some mTOR, some post-workout nutrition. But you know, so I think. We need to start looking at this with some context and realize that there's a lot that we don't know in terms of t tissue specificity. But brilliant question. All right, we got Talking a lot about catabolism and anabolic window, are there some numbers we can put on the proportions during the day that we should be in either? Great question. This is a beautiful question. So. Uh, again, this is kind of me going off script, no human clinical studies to, to necessarily totally support this, but I would say one or two times a day. I think it's good for, for longevity, and that's pretty much most of us in this room. I don't see any professional bodybuilders. Maybe there are a few, and I, I apologize, I'm not trying to offend you, but I, so I think, you know, if, if you're a professional athlete, like you would need to do what you can do to maximize your physique. But if you're an everyday person just trying to get through life without succumbing to chronic disease, I think we want to be a little bit more cautious. So I think one or two meals a day, I think, is probably sufficient for most people. And that's what really kind of lends well with the ketogenic diet because, like, I've been eating since yesterday at 6 p.m. I'm, you know, I'm getting hungry, but I'm going to be okay, right? So that's what I think. And, and we don't need to be scared about the protein in that period of time because we've had mTOR suppression through fasting and everything. So, yeah, you want that bolus. You want that stimulus because mTOR does a lot positive or favorably within our immune system. So we can't be scared about these things. So one or, one or two meals a day, I would say. So great question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I kind of ask this question in a different way to every speaker, but I struggle with anemia and um, it was so bad a couple months ago I had to get infusions of iron and um, I don't know if my fatigue is solely related to that I know that it's partially but that's something that um, 
causes me to struggle with fasting even for four hours, five hours during the day. Like I can eat at 6.30 at night and wake up and eat at nine or 10 a.m. in the morning. But I'm looking for some information on maybe uh, how to address the fatigue and also should I just start doing 18 to 20 hour fast to see how I do because the fatigue I mean it's like brain fog and lightheadedness and it, it's kind of scary so I usually just and I don't substitute with sugar you know I immediately grab protein um, I don't know if it's a salt thing do you have any ideas on that um, oh and I do hit five days a week okay um. Amazing questions, and maybe we can talk in more detail on this, but I think you hit on something that's really important, is uh, oxygen, the oxygen deficiencies, you know, it's called hypoxia, and that creates unique signaling and so forth. So I think uh, in, in your specific case, I wouldn't try to force a 20-hour fast or 22-hour fast if you feel dizzy or lightheaded. Uh, addressing the underlying anemias and the cause of that, and, and it would be huge. And it's really pervasive in women. I know my wife experiences issues with it and so forth. So I would say um, don't try to force that necessarily. And then um, you know, exercise, maybe what you could do to mitigate this. So so the great point here to transition into how can you kind of circumvent this? You could do your HIIT training first thing in the morning, fasted. So depleting glycogen could kickstart the activators or the inducers of autophagy, A and PK is one of the likely mechanism. And so you might be able to say, well, maybe my feeding window is not so compressed as other people, but because I'm compensating by doing fasted HIIT workouts in the morning, for example, eating low carb, high fat, that could be a way to kind of circumvent that a little bit. But yeah, I think get the anemia dialed in so that you're not experiencing those symptoms would be good. Great question. I think there's one more. Uh, yeah, so what I heard was um, that exercise in general, any movement. Uh, you didn't touch on necessarily intensity and duration. So is, is that an important factor in this talk? Yeah, that, that's a great uh, great question. And so interestingly though, some of these studies didn't, didn't quantify intensity duration. They just had people do um, you know, upper body workouts, lower body workouts, things like that. So these studies were not that well controlled because they were long duration, 12 months, 18 months, things like that. But what I would suggest is as long as you're making progress, that's good, right? So if you're going to the gym or you're doing yoga or you're doing Pilates, whatever it is, and you're making progress, how are you making progress? Because your neurologic system and your muscle system, musculoskeletal system is adapting. Those adaptations are autophagy mediated. So if you're going to the gym and it's not working, you're like, wait, I did the same weight a year ago. You're not making progress, right? So change up your workout program. And, and I think, you know, based upon the research that I've read and the different studies, any exercise with regularity will enhance the autophagy. They're just really individualized. Totally, whatever it is for your biomechanics, your goals, things like that. And, and again, to underscore the importance of exercise, do whatever it is that gets you into a flow state. If that's resistance training, great. But if it's yoga, you're still going to benefit from that. All right. Thanks so much, Ben.